I want to share with you today about answering the call of God. Answering the call of God. Somebody say, answer the call of God. We have a lot of breakers that are converging in this. A lot of people that are on Isaiah's map. A lot of people that are maybe connected to our ministry. Many of you who got saved during COVID. Many of you who found your fire during COVID. And you must understand that this is not about a one man. God has raised up men and women of God. Not so that you look at them. It's so that they activate the real call that is inside of you. The next move of God is not going to depend on the stage. It will depend on the pew. It will be you and I. It will be everyday believer being activated by God. To be used by God. To drive out demons. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Make disciples. Baptize people. You are called for such a time as this. You are a royal generation. You are a holy people. You are His own special people. The only reason God raised up people like me. God raised up people like Pastor Mike and Isaiah. And so many others. Not because we're special. But because you're marked by God to be activated by God, to be equipped by God, to live for God, and to make a difference in this world for God. Can somebody shout, Yay! Yeah. Unfortunately, the church has become a destination, but the church is supposed to be a gas station. A gas station where you get fueled up. Your destination is your world. Your platform is your career. Your platform is the marketplace. Your platform is the media, is the education, is the Hollywood, is the government and the church. This conference is a gas station. It's not your destination. Destination is the Holy Spirit moving in your life and through your life at your workplace, at your family dinner, at the Starbucks, at the restaurant. Can somebody say amen? amen. Career is what you choose, a calling you what you discover. Career requires education, calling requires anointing. Career gives you a retirement, calling gives you eternal reward. And it's nothing wrong to have a career, but every person here has a calling. We all have a general calling and that is to love God, to win souls, make disciples, cast out demons and heal the sick. And so many people want to know their specific calling and I always tell them, if you give your attention to your general calling, your specific calling will manifest in God's time. The second most important decision in your spiritual walk after you encounter Jesus is when you discover your purpose. When you run from the call of God, you are running from the presence of God. The Bible says about Jonah and Jonah fled from the presence of God. Where was he running from? The call. God gave him the call to go to Nineveh. And Jonah didn't go to a bar, he just ran from the call of God. And in running from the call of God, he was actually running from the presence of God. God's presence is connected to your purpose. There are people who sometimes say, I don't feel the presence of God. I don't sense the anointing of God. God's anointing doesn't always rest on the person, it rests on the purpose. When a person walks away from their purpose, God's anointing begins to lift. When Saul does not kill Amalekites, God lifts the anointing. Why? Because God's anointing is connected to your assignment. When you don't embrace your assignment, you can pray and fast. You can do all of the stuff the spiritual people need to do. But God's anointing is not for a show. It's not for you. It's so it could be manifested through you. And God will increase His anointing if you stay connected to your assignment. I'm going to share with you just five simple things concerning the call of God. And so if you're taking notes, write the first thing down is, I was born on purpose. Say this with me, say, I was born on purpose. Hebrews 11 and verse 23, it says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, when Moses became of age, refused to be the, called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I was born on purpose. What happened in the days of Moses is what happened in the days of Jesus and is what happened in your day. There was a bloodthirsty Pharaoh. There was a blood 
thirsty Herod and there was a bloodthirsty Roe versus Wade that was killing babies. Moses came at the time where babies' lives wasn't valued. Where they would throw them in the Nile, they would kill them. Midwives were ordered by the king to kill male babies. The same thing started to happen around Jesus' time. Herod wanted to wipe out the children. You came for such a time as this. And the devil knew that there is a generation that's coming. And that's why he went on a slaughter of babies. Because he did not want a deliverer, a breaker, as somebody who is going to shake his kingdom to be born. Some of you maybe are here and you never met your father and your mother and you maybe feel like you were born an accident. Maybe your mom and dad didn't want you, but God used your mom to get you into this world. You didn't come from your parents, you came through your parents. You have a purpose and every suicide spirit was defeated. Every death spirit that wanted to take you out could not take you out. You are standing here because you have a purpose. Somebody shout, I have a purpose. I was born a month after the Chernobyl happened. I was not very far where there was a, one of the largest nuclear explosions that happened in the world. One of the things that even affected my eyesight. And I believe that from the early age, the devil wanted to take me out. Three months before I was born, my mom was told that I am going to be born dead. My grandma started to pray, went to a prophet and the prophet says that child will be born. That child will not die. And I have a purpose for that child. And I believe the same thing is about you. Even if there was no prophet to predict your birth, I'm here to stand. Your birth is a sign you have a purpose. Your birth is a sign that you you have an assignment. Your birth is a sign. You are a threat to the kingdom of darkness. And during the birth there was something that happened where the optical nerve was damaged. And I grew up struggling, believing that I had a purpose. I believed that I was an accident. I believed that my life had no meaning and it had no purpose. But little did I know is that I was wrong. There's not one person under the sound of my voice who does not have an assignment from God. You have an assignment from God. And if maybe you grew up as a foster child, or maybe perhaps you grew up as a person who was rejected by your parents and you're battling with these insecurities, please understand, your parents' love is just an appetizer. God's love is the main meal. Don't curse the restaurant just because you got a small appetizer. Some of us expect too much out of our parents and too little out of our Heavenly Father. And that was my situation. I want to challenge you. Forgive your parents for what they did. Embrace the destiny that God has for you because you are not an accident. You were born on purpose. Somebody say Amen. Purpose can change your life. The second thing that I want to highlight and I'm going to go through this fast. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 23, we've read that the Bible says is that when he became of age, Moses refused. Somebody say refused. And then it says in verse 25, choosing rather to suffer, somebody say suffer, affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. The second thing that I want to highlight and that is this, is you have to leave sin and embrace suffering. You, you're not ready for a call of God if you don't develop a huge threshold for pain. I know many of us come to Jesus to alleviate suffering. But Jesus and the call of God has an element of suffering that many times we don't tell you about. The Bible does not say that Moses forsook pleasures of sin and embraced an abundant life. He embraced a life of suffering. We have taught our people more on how to enjoy life and how to endure life. We have raised snowflakes, spineless Christians who melt when hardships come. Who melt when they get offended. Who melt when their pride get injured. Who melt when somebody doesn't give them their parking space. Who melt when they have to wait for four hours in the line and not get in the service. Why? Because we have a generation that has been massaged in their ego. Instead of being like Moses who the Bible says he embraced suffering with God's people. Living a Christian life is not being on a vacation. It's more like being on a Normandy beach. It's a life of the cross, not a life of a Pepsi-Cola. 
Many of us cannot enter the call of God because we're too soft. We are scared of pain. We are scared of suffering. We are scared of persecution. We are scared of losing our status. We are scared of being cancelled. We are scared of being demonetized. We are scared of being deplatformed. We are scared of getting fired. We are scared of being broken up. That boyfriend leaving you. I want to tell you, you will never walk in the call of God until you have a big threshold for suffering. He suffered. He embraced it. Before God called him, he embraced suffering. Number three, he embraces suffering with God's people. And I want you to see this. He goes far, write this down, go far to find fire. Put this in your notebook, go far to go fire. And I'm going to read from NLT. One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far, somebody say far, far, into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. For 40 years he was a shepherd. But something happened one day when he went beyond the border of what was familiar. When he went further than before. When he went far into wilderness, he experienced a fire. He needed that fire to walk in that calling. Because every person must understand God's callings are activated by God's encounters. An encounter with God activates your calling. You need, I need the fire of God for a calling. What has happened in our nation is the Christianity has become this, where you want to fulfill the call of God, you go and get a degree. A biblical way was never a degree, is you have to get fire. That's why we have dead preachers preaching dead sermons to dead people. That's why churches are closing. Because a degree does not break the anoint, the break the yoke. Anointing breaks the yoke. Degree does not drive out demons. Anointing drives out demons. A degree does not cause a homosexual to become a saint. It is the power of the Holy Ghost. And Moses could not deliver a nation before Moses would have an encounter with the fire of God. Somebody shall fire. How do you get this fire? Do you go to the conference? Could be you can get it at the conference. You can get a spark, but you don't burn continuously on fire until you find a mountain. God's fires come on God's mountains. And if you don't find your mountain, you will not find the fire that you need to activate the call that you have. So many of us are looking for connections and so many of us were like, man, if only this person can get me on their podcast, if only this pastor could just open the door for me, if only you can climb the mountain, the hill of the Lord, if only you can encounter the presence of Jesus, you won't have to pull yourself by your shoelaces because once God sets you on fire, listen, things begin to fall into place and no, you're not going to be like me, you're not going to be like him, you're going to be like you that God created you to be. The world does not need another lad. The world needs another you. But the real you is trapped inside because until you meet the fire, your calling won't start working. You don't need a Facebook page to get your calling going. You need a fuego, a fire. Every breaker under the sound of my voice, you need a fire. But the fire comes on a mountain. You climb mountains, we slide down, we climb up. Anybody who ever went hiking, you know that it's hard. It's not easy. But I want you to notice this word, he went far. Some of you fasted three days, nothing happened. What if the fire is outside of the border of what you're accustomed to. Some of you tithe, you've never given a sacrifice. What if your fire 
is outside of what you're familiar with. What if this year you will say, I will go far. The devil will tell you you'll get lost and you say, he'll find me. My pastor will, if the Lord won't, go far into the wilderness. I remember when the ministry was struggling for over 12 years as a youth pastor. I knew I had a call of God. I had a prophetic word when I was about 14 years of age. I, had a, I felt like I had an audible voice at the age of 16 on the parking lot of a grocery store of what the church is going to look like, but something was trapped. It's almost like there was this ceiling. It's almost like there was like this limitation. No matter what I tried, there was just simply the same thing. Until being on the aisle seat of Alaska flight to Sacramento. And I was a tither all my life and I heard the Holy Spirit. At first I thought it was the devil because I rebuked it. And this was what I heard, give all of your savings away. And I said, no, I can't go that far. I'm comfortable. I'm living a fasted life. I'm living a life of giving. I'm living a life of serving God. But I also have a fence around my commitment to God. This is as far as I go. I know I can go further, but I'm scared. What if I die behind this fence? This fence of familiarity was electrocuted. There was electricity attached to it. I would never dare to go there. And when I climbed over my fence for the first time in my life and gave like I would die tomorrow, I met fresh fire. When COVID happened, because I got used to living on the edge, I felt the Holy Spirit. We started a 21 day water fast with the church. And on the sixth day, I remembered it like yesterday. It was also in California. I'm on my knees just praising Jesus. And I felt the Holy Spirit. My fence for fasting is 21 days. I don't do more than 21 days. That's the most. After 21 days, I die. <laughs> the Holy Spirit stood outside of my fence and said, climb over. And I want you to do what my son did. I want you to go for a 40 day fast. I said, Lord, you know I'm going to die. He said, that's actually the plan. <laughs> Physically, he says, you won't die. And I remember climbing over that fence and going for 40. It has nothing to do with a 40 day fast or a sacrifice. It has to do with this principle. Moses went far into the wilderness. Could it be that your call is waiting? for you to step outside of what you have said is your spiritual limit. Of what you have said, you're familiar, comfortable, and this is convenient. And you're not going to go past that. I want to challenge you. I want to provoke you. I want to make you slightly miserable and afflicted. Because if there is no call flourishing, that means fire has become too small. If you're burned out, if you're like a leader, like Moses, who tried to do the call of God in your own strength, and you're burned out with ministry and you say, I will never do it again. The church hurts people. The ministry destroyed my family. No, 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 it's not the ministry. It's the problem is the ministry was never supposed to be done without the anointing. It was never supposed to be done without God's grace. It was never supposed to be done without God's power and without the help of the Holy Spirit. When you do it in your own strength, you will strain your back. I want to invite you to have an experience with the fire of God. Because when you have a fresh fire, your call will become more real. But you don't get a fresh fire if you don't go far. What would happen if you would give that represented going far? What would happen if you would pray that symbolized going far? Some of you are comfortable with your five minute prayer in the Quran. Nothing wrong with that, but that worked when you were a baby Christian. Some of you are comfortable only fasting a breakfast when you didn't have time to prepare one. That worked when you were a baby Christian. But you cannot get a fresh fire if you don't go a little bit further. Go far if you want fire. 
If you will look back at your life when you die, your regret will not be that you poured your life out to God. Your regret will be is that you preserved yourself too much. I want to die in such a way where disciples like Judas will accuse me and say, it's a waste what Vlad does. It's a waste the way he gives. It's the waste the way he prays. It's the way waste the way he serves. Why? Because I know on the other side of going far is fresh fire. Are you with me? Number four. I want you to notice when Moses encounters the fire of God, God speaks to him. And this is what God says. Now therefore, and that's Exodus 3.9. Now therefore behold the cry, somebody say the cry, of the children of Israel has come to me and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Write this down, number four. The call of God on my life is an answer to the cry of my generation. Write this, I'm gonna say that again. Say this with me, say the call of God. I can hear you, say the call of God. On my life is an answer to the cry of my generation. God comes to Moses and God says, Moses, I heard the cry of my people. For 40 years, Moses has blocked any of his people from his Twitter thread feed. Moses has disconnected himself to, to be completely oblivious to the suffering and the pain of his people because he used to be there, he's no longer there. But every single day and every single night, God heard the cry of his people and our God, even though he tarries in answering the cry, he heard, saw the suffering of his people. And when the prayer, when the bottle of tears got filled, God picks up the call, picks up the phone and starts dialing people in the nearest proximity and starts calling them. He starts promising them power. He starts promising to use them. And it's not because they are special. It's because there has been a cry God seeks to answer. I remember when this became apparent to me. We just moved, this was about six years, or six or seven years ago, actually eight years ago, we just moved close to the church. Had this neighbor, a wonderful older gentleman. We interacted, but I was always in a hurry. I didn't have a chance to actually have a conversation with him. He was either in a hurry, I was in a hurry. And I lived very close to church, he lived very close to church. And I was waiting for the right time to talk to him about Jesus and bring him to our church. We finally moved in, everything was fine. And then I had a few trips, I didn't see him, he didn't see me. And then another month, I, I stopped seeing him completely. And then I see FBI raiding his house, turning everything over. And I was like, what is happening? So I kind of left that alone. Me and my wife go for the rollerblading and my wife brings this question. She says, I haven't seen our neighbor and I have this heavy feeling about him. And I said, that's weird. I wasn't even thinking about our neighbor, but now that you're saying that. So I did what every millennial does. I googled my neighbor's um, address, found his parcel number, and typed his name into Facebook, didn't find him, into Instagram, didn't find him. It wasn't a surprise because he was older. I put him into every database, couldn't find him. Then I put him into Google. And when I punched him into Google, the first article showed up and it was an obituary. I clicked on a local newspaper and I found out my neighbor has been dead for two months already. A month later, they put his house for sale. A realtor lady comes to show the house. Before the new people to buy the house come in there, she comes to my house and I'm in the driveway washing my car. So I'm washing my car, getting ready for the service. She comes, she's like, sir, are you his neighbor? I said, yes, I am his neighbor. She says, do you want to go see his house? And I'm like, uh, um, and I kind of remember, I'm like, well, Vlad, behave, uh, you're a pastor. I just kind of go along with it. And I said, ma'am, I'm kind of busy, but yeah, yeah, I, I, I would love to go see his house. Even though I didn't have time and I didn't want to go see his house because I knew how his house looked. We get inside of the house and I'm just literally thinking, irritating because this lady is wasting my time. My car, I need to wash, finish washing my car. 
And so I'm walking through the house. I was like, oh yeah, this was great. It's an empty house. There's nothing to see there. I'm just walking with her just to make her not be, you know, upset at me. In the living room, I see a piece of carpet cut out. So just to waste time. And I said, oh wow, that was great. A little design he had over there probably. And I'm walking by and she says, you don't know how he died. And I said, well, he was old. She said, that's not how he died. I said, enlighten me. He said, that's where he shot himself. He said, this man struggled with loneliness and depression. He works for the government. He didn't have a lot of family. He didn't have a lot of people. I'm like, no way. He could not have shot himself. Every time I saw him, he smiled. He says, that's the image he portrayed to the world. I never finished washing my car. I got into the room. I locked myself in the room and I started repenting before God. Because every time they felt prompted to tell him about Christ, I always was in a hurry for something else. And when I got on my knees, I remember I say, God, I'm so sorry that you placed a neighbor so close to me and, and I'm out of all people was the pastor and he was actually open to talk to me, but I just didn't find time. And I remember the Holy Spirit says something that changed my life. He said this, he says, that man has been crying to me. He says, I heard his cry every day and every night. He said, I strategically positioned him. I've been waiting for that moment. He says, I've been reaching to you. When I've been whispering to you, it's because he's been crying to me. He says, I wasn't tugging on your heart just because I wanted to make you an evangelist. I've been busy answering his cry, but you couldn't answer the call. You always had a busy signal. And because he had a busy, you had a busy signal. I couldn't answer his cry because you didn't answer my call. The call of God upon your life it's not because you're special. The call of God upon your life, it's not because you're unique. The call of God upon your life, it's not because you're anointed. The call of God upon your life has one purpose. God who created every human being, Muslim, Buddhist, atheist, homosexual, transgender, people that are confused. And every night they can portray themselves online one way. But every night they soak their pillow with tears. Their parents will give their last money to put them through a rehab. And God hears the cry. So when He calls you, make no mistake, it's not about you. Moses, I don't care that you don't speak well. Moses, I don't care that you were burned by Egypt. Moses, I don't care you have your life established. Moses, I don't care that you don't want to go back to Egypt. Moses, I heard the cry of my people. Moses, I will turn your rod into a miracle weapon. Moses, I will put a voice inside of your mouth. Moses, Hollywood will make movies about you years, years, years down the road. Moses, I will give you whatever you need or want. But Moses, I can't answer a cry if you don't answer the call. When God called me at the age of 16 in my office, and I felt God say, I'm calling you son. I was so scared to answer the call because I was afraid that I would be poor for the rest of my life. I was afraid to answer the call because I said, who will listen to a guy with a weird eye? Who will listen to a guy who barely speaks English at the time? Who will listen to a guy? God, I'm not the right guy. God says, I know you're not the right guy, but lad, I ain't got a lot of options. I thought my credentials matter. God says, I don't care about that. God says, I can do anything with anyone. But Vlad, please understand, I'm busy answering the cry of your generation. Will you answer my call? I said, Lord, at 16, if you can do something with someone like me, if there is a place for someone like me in your kingdom, God count me in. Little did I know the cry that God was hearing I will be able to meet those people down the road. A mother who had a son that committed the old deed four times in one month, declared dead by police because of drug use. And this young man stepped into a church. His name is Brian. 
And I remember when Brian got saved. I went to his court hearing because he had so many drug uh, stuff that he needed to pay and finally he cleared all of his stuff and the judge cleared his record and I was standing there and his mom was there who was not a Christian that night. His mom gave her life to, his, her life to Jesus. His mom moves to Tri-Cities. Listen to this. His mom sells the property, gives a large check to the church. And I remember when his mom hugged me. And she said, thank you for saving my son. I said, ma'am, I didn't save your son. I just preached the gospel. He says, you don't understand. He says, I buried that man already. Today, that Brian finished bachelor's degree. He's married. He's a generous, he's, he's a godly man. God heard the cry of Brian. And 12, 20 years ago, he was calling an insecure teenager like me. I thought the reason why God was calling me is because He wanted to make my life miserable. I thought the reason why He was calling me because maybe I had something special. That's why I kept saying, God, I'm not special. God says, it's not about you. It's about the cry of your generation. It's about the cry of people demonized, people that are sick, people that are lost, people that are confused, people that are tormented. They're my children. I love them. You may not feel that cry right now. You may not care about those people right now. You're looking at your business. You're looking at your busy life as a mom. You're looking at your busy life as a student and you say, God, I don't have time for all of this, but please understand. Your God looks at the humanity, not as Christians, not Christians. God doesn't look at the humanity as, well, these are homosexuals and these are good people. God looks at the humanity as a father, looks at his children. If you have five children, imagine you're going on a vacation. On the way back from the vacation, you realize one of your kids is missing. You won't say, ah, oh, it's just one. We still got four. You won't look at your spouse and say, well, it's an 80% success rate. You won't do math with your kids. You can think about your family with percentages because you're a father. God doesn't look at our city and say, well, look, 10% goes to church. It's a win, Gabriel. It's a win, Michael. God looks at every human being that carries his imprint and says, they're my people and they're hurting. Let me call 3,000 breakers. Let me call 3,000 people. But a lot of us, what we do is we make up excuses. There are people under the sound of my voice that God called you to pastor a church. God called you to lead a small group and you've been making excuses. And you always said that you are not qualified. You're not good enough. Today I'm here to shatter those excuses and to say, if you don't answer the call, how can God answer the cry? You may not be able to do what I do, but you can do what God called you to do. One man in Australia, he was living on the edge. And when he was on that edge, found out people would come to the edge and look over the cliff. He looks again, they're disappearing. He went to the doctor and said, doctor, can you check my eyesight? I'm seeing stuff and I'm not seeing stuff. The doctor checked his eyesight. He said, your eyesight is fine. He picks up a local newspaper, finds out the backyard of his house is the top suicide place in Australia. He says, what can I do? I'm an older man. I don't communicate to young kids. I don't have what, I don't know what to say to them. Him and his wife says this, but we can make cookies and milk. Anytime he would see somebody standing on the cliff, he would come up today to them and he would say, what is your name? They would say, my name is so-and-so. He said, we're older people. We live over here. Nobody visits us. We just made cookies and milk. Could you help us to eat them? He says, I would pull, I would, he said, I would emotionally manipulate them. And they would feel bad for older people. They would walk. And he says, by the time they took the cookie, they would say, I came here to end my life, but you're saving my life through this cookie. It was cookies and milk. Let's lift those hands right now. I have one more point that I might get to it about right now. For those of you that maybe you've been running from the call of God. And I really sensed, even as I was standing on the stage, there's Jonas. That the reason why God sent a storm in your life is not to punish you, but to wake you up. 
to wake you up back to your calling. God is going to anoint you. God is going to release fresh anointing upon your life. If you find your mountain. But not only if you find your mountain, if you choose to go just a little bit further. There's somebody here that you need to go just a little bit further than you went before. You need to give just more than because God is, and I'm not saying this, but if God has been telling you, God wants you to go just a little bit further in your purity, in your consecration. He wants to release a fresh fire in your life. But He wants you to say yes to Him. Come on, everybody from the balcony all the way in the front. Lift those hands right now. Just whether you're seated or you are standing. And begin to say, God, I surrender to your call right now. God, I want to say yes to you. Come on, I want to hear a sound in this room right now. Come on, make some noise. Begin to pray. Begin to pray. Begin to drown that AC sound by your, pra by your prayer right now. Say, Lord, I say yes to the call. Lord, I say yes to the call. I say yes to your call right now. I say yes to your call right now now I surrender to you I surrender to you my excuses I surrender to you my fears I surrender to you my insecurities Lord I surrender to you lack of this and lack of that Lord I surrender come on say this with me I will answer the call I can hear you say I will answer the call so God can answer the cry if you are able to and you are sitting I want you to stand. If you are on your knees and the Lord is moving right now, just keep, keep, keep being on your knees. Moses, can, can I have a water? And oh, if you can open the water, uh, it's, it's fine, I want to have no water. Uh -huh. And can I have one person on your staff that I could kindly abuse? You okay? We'll do you. Hold this. Uh, give a microphone. Give a mic. I want you to hold this. I want you to hold this water. Okay. I'm gonna share with you. I said five things. I'm gonna share with you last thing, because Moses, he answered the call. I said just just one second, guys. Guys, just just if you, uh, those of you at the front for just one second. Could you just just pause just for just one second? We'll continue deliverance. We're gonna do deliverance tonight, and we're gonna continue that in just a, one moment. Just 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 one second. Unless the Lord is moving in your life, you can just be in, the, be in that mode, be in that atmosphere right now. But Moses, he had a fresh encounter. Moses received the call. Moses said yes. He eventually went to the people that God heard their cry. He was used of God mightily. He kept going to the same mountain for more encounters. Because an encounter with God changes your life. Encounters with God will change your world. <laughs> but I'm going to have one more thing that I want to share. Moses never entered the promised land. Well, he did enter it in the New Testament on the Mount of Transfiguration. But he didn't enter it to live there. Not because he lacked anointing. Not because his church started with about 600,000 soldiers. That's not women or children included. His church was the largest church that anybody has probably has ever had. He's seen greater miracles than anybody has ever. God has not spoke to people like He spoke to Moses. But I want to let you know, Moses did not enter the promised land. He didn't reach what God called him to reach. Not because he lacked anointing or dedication. What he lacked was character. Moses had an anger problem. It's an anger he killed a guy who was fighting with an Israelite. He took the tablets, came down with the tablets and when he saw Israel committing sin, he broke those tablets. And one day when God called him to speak to the rock, Moses hit the rock. And when he was reflecting and it wasn't the problem that Moses had an anger problem. It's that Moses never acknowledged that he had a problem. I'm going to read something to you and I'm going to finish on this. Numbers 20:12. it says that God said to Moses, because you didn't believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you will not bring this assembly into the land which I've given them. But I want you to notice how Moses sees it. Because in Deuteronomy 1, 37, he says this, the Lord was angry with me for your sake. Meaning he says, Y'all are the problem. 
It's not my fault. You guys were the ones. And because you were bad, I acted bad. Moses was a great man of God. Don't get me wrong because I don't want him one day to listen to this and me and, and him have a problem in heaven. I love Moses. But something that I want to highlight that destroys callings of God. The last thing that I want to share with you and write this down. Your character will limit your calling. It might not be passion, anointing or fasting, lack of sacrifice. For Moses what restricted his calling was his character. And you can have a gifts of the Holy Spirit but without having the fruit. What is the fruit does? A fruit feeds people. And so many people who have gifts, what they do is on the stage they operate in the gift. And in the mall they operate in the gift. In the workplace they operate in the gift. But when they come home, they don't have a fruit. So their family goes hungry. Saying, I don't want Jesus. I don't want anointing. I don't want that. Why? Because we're deprived of your attention. We're deprived of your kindness. You're always angry. You're always cranky. You're always impatient. You don't have joy. You don't have love. And yes, you're changing the world. But you're destroying your family. How? Because you don't have a fruit. When you have a fruit, good character, you're feeding your family, your wife, your children. When you don't have a fruit, your family is fed up by you. Until they say, we don't want to do anything with what you're doing. And they say, oh, the devil has come up and destroyed my family and caused my family not to love Jesus. Not really, it wasn't the devil. It was that your tree was barren. You can be Moses and deliver a nation and have a, have a bad character. And then what I want to challenge you today, as God begins to use you, you never forsake your character. Why? And the biggest thing about our character, everybody has flaws, including myself. This is the biggest thing. God will send people in your life. I want you to hold this. No, no, a little bit closer. God will send people in your life who do this. That's exactly what they will do. They will come in your life and they will provoke your problems. And this is what you will say. You say, ah, they made me do it. You guys are the ones that made me angry. That's what Moses said. The problem is you always had anger there. Always. As long as you have it, they will provoke it. And God will allow that so that you say, I have a problem. And my problem is anger. As long as you're blaming your circumstances, your spouse on your anger, it's like blaming your mirror for your bad looks. So what you got to do is you got to bring it to God and put it out. And this is what's going to happen after that. When you deal with it, people will come and they will do this. God will use your spouse, God will use your children, God will use your employees, God will use people closest to you to provoke those issues because God knows you and I got them. And God will never fix them until we acknowledge it. If we live like Moses and we say, yeah, the reason I'm not entering the promised land, God was angry with me because y'all made me angry. No, they didn't make me angry. I'm an angry person who needs to repent of anger and you are causing me to know that I'm an angry person. So thank you for letting me know because it's something I need to go and put it out to Jesus so Jesus can fix my character. So I'm not just anointed, but I'm also not annoying. So I'm not just prophetic, but I'm also not pathetic. And so that I live my life with the fruit of the Spirit and with the power of the Holy Ghost. So I'm not just delivering a nation, but I'm also entering the promised land. Me and my children are entering the promised land. Place your hand upon your heart right now. Place your hand upon your heart. And some of you have this problem. Is you look like this right now. Somebody always drives you crazy. But the reason why they're driving you crazy because you got crazy in your bottle. And right now just, just tell the Lord, say Lord. Say this with me, say Lord. I'm messed up. I acknowledge that. Can you change me? And anytime those people drive me crazy, I will take responsibility for my responses. Even if it's not my fault.
change me and change the world through me in Jesus name. Amen.